And we are live. This is Value After Hours. I am Tobias Carlyle, joined as always by my co-host, Jake Taylor. Our special guest today is John Rotonti Jr. What's up, John? How are you? Hi, Tobias. Hi, Jake. Thanks for having me on the show again. I'm well, doing really back. well. Yeah, thank you. Doing I, well. I see that I'm no longer esteemed co-host. It's, I've been demoted to just regular <laughs> co-host. Were you esteemed? <laughs> I, I felt a bit bad. I, I thought maybe that was like a... That's too much. Nick Biz or something. <laughs> You've been demoted. Now you're just, yeah. Now you're just longtime co host. That's yeah. no, no veggies. The you spark, the, the spark is gone, TC. It's, <laughs> we're just going through the motions now. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. My esteemed co host, Jake Taylor. <laughs> there you go. Uh, John, for folks who aren't familiar with your work, give us a brief background. Left the Motley Fool. Yeah. What are you up to now? Uh, so I left The Motley Fool about a year ago, almost exactly. I was there for nine years. I was a senior analyst and the head of investor training and development. And since then, I have uh, been working on my podcast, The j Row Show, where I try to um, interview portfolio managers, portfolio managers for some of the biggest, most respected investment management firms in the country, really about their philosophy, but really their process as well. So I'm not, you know, I've, done, I've, I've published eight episodes now and I haven't asked for one stock idea. I love stock ideas. It's just, that's not what I'm going for on the podcast. It's just really about like, what is the research process? What is the day to day um, life of an analyst or portfolio manager at the firm? What is expected of the analyst down to, you know, how many ideas are they expected to pitch a year? What is the deliverable expected to look like? Is it three pages? Is it 30 pages? Is there a model attached? Is there a PowerPoint attached? Just kind of deep into the weeds of what yeah. their day-to-day -day process looks like. Teach Amanda Fish. And that, yeah. And the other that, one too is, um, oh gosh, who was it now? Was it Picasso? He had a, a club, like a, a, artists would get together and it was called the Turpentine Club, I think. And it was because... They didn't want to get together and talk about like art history or, or whatever. They want to know like where could you buy cheap turpentine. Love it, <laughs> love it. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll say about the show is I hope to um, start releasing some different content on the podcast. So uh, I have just recently recorded a interview with the CEO of a company that I own stock in, and so I'll start be I'll, I'll start to roll out some of these CEO interviews. What, uh, having conducted all these conversations with these guys, what do you have any ideas about a good way to run a firm, or what's what's what sort of works, what's successful, and or what's a what's something to avoid? Commonalities. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, so I've done maybe two really um, respected value investing firms in Harris Oakmark, and I'm going to release Diamond Hill next week, Ooh, and then nice I've one. done to sort of really respected uh, GARPI, you know, growth at a reasonable price firm in Poland Capital and Parnassus. Um, and there's so many similarities. You know, uh, most analysts are expected to cover about 15 stocks, uh, you know, on average. Most analysts are expected, and, and you know, on average across these four big firms, uh, most analysts are expected to pitch about three to four new ideas every year. Um all of those firms that I just mentioned, the analysts are expected to do three statement financial modeling. So, you know, a lot of times when people hear modeling, they just think about like it's simple DCF. That's, that's not what these firms are talking about. So if you're interviewing at these firms, they want to know that you can, you know, build out all three financial statements, like a, like a wall street, you know, equity research report, connect the financial statements. Um, and they all model out, you know, Parnassus models out um, earnings per share three years the others go out five to seven years. So that, that's kind of common expectations. Cover 15 stocks, find me three or four new actionable undervalued ideas a year. Um, and, you know, model out, keep it, keep an up-to-date model, update it quarterly, model out uh, anywhere from three to five years. Um, what you think per share, you know, economic value is going to be, and then, and then put what you believe is an appropriate multiple. Um, those are, you know, those are some, some commonalities. I'll tell you one that I think is common across them. And then you can ask me any questions you want. Um, 
a lot of these a lot of these investors have learned to sell quickly and almost ruthlessly when something comes out of nowhere and surprises them. It, it, it's not it's not that they don't have the emotional discipline to hold on. It's it's that if something comes out of nowhere surprises them that was not in their original analysis was not part of their original thesis. Rather than put investor capital at risk, rather than risk uh, a blow up in that name, and you know some of these funds are concentrated, and you give a blow up in one name, that can really mess with the earnings compounding of the entire portfolio. And so what they do is they will they will sell. This doesn't happen often where you get surprised out of nowhere, but when it does, they will sell out and and then rethink it and then rehash it before deciding to get back in or not. So that that's a, that's a commonality I have found. Mm. It's a Julian Robertson Tiger approach. It, it 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 is. It is Julian Robertson, you know, Bill Miller adopted that approach. So I interviewed Bill Miller in print um 2014 or 2015 and I asked him some of the lessons he learned from his tough time during the global financial crisis and he said one of the biggest lessons and corrections they made was that selling out quickly when just something unexpected happens. Yeah. And so, you know, I think some other good investors have sort of adopted that practice as well. Um, just before we came on, we were talking about Einhorn's latest letter. Yeah. So it's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, recently. And so, I, you know, David Einhorn is an investor that I have deep admiration for. In fact, if you were to ask me you know who I want to have most on on my podcast, the Jero Show. It would it would be David Einhorn, um, and he's done a few interviews where he's talked about this, and then he wrote up he wrote about it in his year end twenty twenty three letter where he said that um, he he can no longer his theory his philosophy is he can no longer wait for the market to properly value stocks. So traditional value investing was. You, you buy what you believe to be an undervalued security and you wait for the market. If you're right, sometimes you'll be wrong, but if you're right, you wait for the market to come around to your correct point of view and the market will re-rate the shares higher. And then you can benefit in two ways. You benefit from the closing of the gap um, from the stock price to the estimate of intrinsic value, which is higher than the stock price. And then you can also benefit from growth of per share value over time. Einhorn believes that um, the active fund management industry has been decimated. That's the word that he used in his 2023 letter. And I can read a, a quote if you'd like. And, One out of 10 have been gone out into yeah. the field and killed themselves. So that, <laughs> right. And that's so, the front and the enemy. Yeah. And, and, and you know, <laughs> that certain companies have been forgotten or left for dead. They're just not covered anymore. And so he, he doesn't think he can rely on the market to properly value these securities anymore, at least not in a reasonable time period. So he doesn't think he can rely on the market to re-rate a company to a higher deserving justified multiple. Uh, and so he sort of shifted his strategy, at least in his larger positions, of investing in companies that are not only cheap, um, but that are currently returning, you know, gobs of cash to shareholders through either dividends buybacks or in some cases um, interest on like a high yielding debt security. So he's getting current cash flow from the securities. Um, it's something, you know, I've been thinking a lot about. And then I was recently, I, I read the, the most recent issue of Value Investor Insight with Murray Stahl, the founder of Horizon Kinetics. And he said something very similarly. You know, here's just one sentence, but he said, quote, obviously some stocks deserve to be inexpensively priced, but cheapness can also just be a reflection that fewer people care and no one is paying attention, end quote. And so I thought it was something very similar to what David Einhorn was saying, that some of these stocks, even good businesses that don't deserve to be cheap, have just been completely forgotten and left for dead because there is so much, um, you know, nearsightedness or even manic, you know, laser focus on some of these tech names right now, that, that large swaths of the market, good growing, profitable growing business are just forgotten about. Um, do you, do you agree that that is the traditional definition of value that it was 
price section that was the thing that delivered the returns. Jake, I think he's probably asking you. <laughs> uh, well, I kind of, I think I know what JT's answer is going to be, but JT would say no, and I would, I would agree with that. But go ahead, Jake. Please, uh, please, we can have a larger conversation around this. Uh, I think it depends on which lots of different flavors of value over the years. Like there have been, uh, yeah. you know, in a, if you're buying net nets, it was probably more of a valuation re-rating but when you took existential risk off the table for a few of these companies, like it's a pretty big binary change there when it went from this company's going to zero to wait, this might actually last a little bit longer. There's a big step up there. Um, <clears throat> kind of non-linear in the other, you know, version of like, oh, never really a question about whether it's a going concern or not, but just more like it's cyclical or, you know, maybe it's best days are a little bit behind it, but it's not, you know, there's still a viable business here. That one might've been a little bit less on, on just pure re-rating. Um, but I would imagine that the, the neglect is, is likely more of a benign thing now just from so much indexation i mean that's it there's yeah there's just not enough people looking and john huber would it's not john huber's idea but john huber talks about it a lot just the differential between even big well-followed companies will vary widely over the course of a year from a low and the, the difference between the low and the high might be three times or 30 percent yeah Green, which way greenblatt going. would start his class with he'd pull up the paper and show like the 52 week high and the 52 week low for 50% difference, the huge differences yeah. on these like giant blue chip, you know, very stable. As far as you looked at any of the, the business results are, are relatively stable compared to these 50% swings in the price. I think your return is kind of embedded when you buy, like you've, you, whatever the stock price does, you're, you're getting this expected return and provided that the stock does what you anticipated that it would do. You're getting that return whether the market recognizes it or not. But having said that, I think that Buffett's strategy is exactly that, to buy something where the expectation is that he's going to get a lot of his capital back pretty quickly. I think he's done that in just about every single big acquisition that he's done from the railroads to take your pick. He's looking for, you know, to Oxy recently, you know, he's pinning them to the mast by putting that plan to return capital in his own meeting notes saying, hey, you said this, we're going to hold to this publicly. Absolutely. So I agree that even though I think Einhorn's being a little bit cute with the reasoning, but I think that the the outcome is right. Yeah, I agree with the outcome. So, so the way you asked the question, Tobias, was do you think value investor returns have largely come from that? No, I, I, I believe said, yeah, it was... traditional, traditional. Was that, is that the traditional expectation? Right. So I, I think I think the philosophy and where the returns actually came from may be different. I think the philosophy was buying at a large margin of safety, buying a dollar for fifty cents. Right, with the expectation that it's eventually going to be valued at a dollar. Right? Well, can, is that was that an expectation of traditional value investors that the margin of safety would close, and so you buy, you know, you buy it when it's trading at fifty cents on the dollar, and then if you're right, you start to sell, you know, when it's trading at ninety cents on the dollar, and then you're well, out by the time it's a dollar. Give the give the example of the of Nigren's six times earnings. Right, and so in the real world, I do. Did you just explain? Because we, I think we talked about that offline. Talk about the yeah. So in do in, that calculation in, for everybody. Absolutely. So in my um, most recent print interview with Bill Nigren, he says, consider a stock at six times earnings, where business value is flat. If the cash conversion rate is 100%, the company could reduce shares outstanding by 17% annually and grow per share value by 20%. So just to recap, he's saying six times PE, business value is flat. Earnings are not growing. They're just stable. Free cash flow conversion to net income is one times or 100%. In that scenario, the company could reduce shares outstanding by 17% annually and grow per share value by 20%. So earnings per share are growing by 20%, even though net income is growing 0%. And actually, so Robeson put out uh, a white paper like a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, talking about this very thing, 
how low PEs can drive massive EPS growth when, when you're buying at a discount. So let's keep this thought experiment going. Let's say I own stock in a company that's doing that and it buys back stock and eventually it buys back all of the outstanding stock and I'm the only person left. Right. Do right. I care where the bid is in the market or am I getting the intrinsic flows that are far so, superior to anything that I've ever paid? So uh, th this wasn't uh, this wasn't planned, but but so in the same interview, nothing is on this show, right? No, I love this. <laughs> in, in the same interview, Bill Nargan says, if a company generates a lot of excess cash and buys back stock when the valuation is too low that eventually forces the valuation higher. So there's a forking, forcing mechanism. So Tobias and Jake, so think about- But I'm not even, I don't even need it. I don't even need a quote. I'm saying I like this thing, unquote. I love this thing. I love, so if if this, let's let's use easy math. I can go through the math of the 17%, the 20% if y'all want, because I I broke it out for a student that I mentor, but <laughs> um, let's just yeah, do it. Let's math. do it. Let's, 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 let's do it. Let's break it out. So it, it'll just take me a second. I have it. I have it right here. So let's assume, um, let's assume EBIT. Let's assume zero, uh, zero debt. Just so interest expense is zero. EBIT is one twenty five, hundred twenty five dollars. Tax rate is twenty percent. Assume a hundred shares outstanding. Tax rate is twenty percent. So twenty percent of one hundred twenty five is twenty five dollars in taxes. So net income is a hundred. We also know, based on the Niagara quote. That free cash flow is at least 100 because free, free cash flow conversion is 100%. So he gave us a PE of six, right? So uh, PE of six, we know that net income is 100. So six times 100, we know the market value is 600. So we have a market cap of 600, 100 shares outstanding. So stock price is six. Now, you repurchase 17% of 100 shares outstanding which means you buy back 17 shares for $102. 17 shares times the $6 per share stock price. Okay, that's $102. So you spent all of your free cash flow. Free cash flow was 100. In this example, we're saying 102. Uh, net income is still 100 because remember, he said earnings are stable or flat. And buybacks come out of uh, distributable or free cash flow, not from net income. So net income is still 100. Shares outstanding are now 83. We started with 100 shares. We, we bought back 17. We now have 83 shares outstanding. So original EPS was $1. Net income of 100 divided by 100 shares outstanding, $1. The new EPS after the buyback is 120. Net income of still 100 now divided by 83 shares outstanding. That's $1.20. So EPS went from $1 to $1.20. You get 20% growth in earnings per share when you buy back 17% of the shares. When the PE is six, net income did not grow one penny. So that's the power of buybacks at low PEs or high free cash flow yields. I saw a good uh, Twitter. As it, this has been on Twitter for the last week, but they said, what is the... If Michael Saylor continues to buy back Bitcoin and yeah. he ends up owning all of Bitcoin, what is the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? Oh, I didn't see that tweet. Did it did it give a answer? Well, it's gotta be, you know, it's a thought experiment, but you yeah. can you can work it out if Michael Saylor but, owns all of Bitcoin. But but Tobias, here here is not a thought experiment. So let's just use easy math. Ten times earnings and you're buying back ten percent of shares a year. Ten percent of the market cap a year. If the stock price does not go up then you end up owning the entire company after 10 years. That sounds that's great. The, that's the forcing mech. Well, I know you love that, but that's the forcing mechanism that Bill Nygren talked about in that interview. When you're buying back stock at low PEs, at, but really at, at large discounts to intrinsic value, it forces the multiple higher. Otherwise, you're going to end up owning the entire thing while earnings per share are growing 20, 30, 40% a year because you're buying it back at lower and lower PEs. I mean, let's do it. This so, is I how I win. Yeah, this is how I win. Exactly right. <laughs> and so I gave a little like a, it was kind of a private presentation. I don't know, two or three years ago now. And I went through a lot of this math and used AutoZone as an example of kind of what what this looked like in an archetypal sense. Absolutely. Very minimal 
top line growth, margin stayed reasonably, you know, call it 11, 12%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lots of buybacks done at very, and they had the, the opportunity to do it. Like they never got much above a 10 PE for that entire time. And so- It's a beautiful thing. It's a, beautiful it's a very thing. beautiful thing. So then I, I broke it down to really, you could turn the world into two, two types of investors. The ones who on the day that they buy, they hope to see the price go down. And then there's the ones who buy and they hope to see the price go up. Which one, which one are you? And this is like in, in one world, like I would say the last 10 years or maybe call it the t- 2008 to 2021, maybe time period. The, you did better if you were the type who bought something and just wanted to see the price go up that next day. Uh, my hypothesis is that the next 10 years, this the 20s, and, and the title of the talk was the the boring 20s instead of roaring, um, in that it wasn't going to be top line. It wasn't going to be, you know, prices ripping and multiples going up. It was going to be it was going to be boring stuff like capital allocation, reasonable business results that then were translated into a really a, a cheap multiple turning into an attractive earnings yield on the purchase. Uh, and that that was how you were going to win the next 10 years. Jake, I, I I not only love that, but I agree one hundred. I agree one hundred percent. In Sea Change, which Howard Marks wrote, I don't know, a year and a half ago, he said basically the same thing. What worked during the era of free money is not what is going to work going forward. Um, Murray Style had some other interesting. You had some other interesting insights into Murray Style too. Oh, so I I, I just think that that Murray is. Um, He's an incredible thinker. So I saw him speak live um, last year at the uh, Project Punch Card conference in New York. Um, I've heard of that one. What's that about? So it uh, it's actually the lineup is always incredible. So last year's lineup was like uh, Lee Cooperman. Uh, by the by the way, Lee is the second guy that I want to get on my show the most. So he he calls in over Zoom. Everyone else is speaking live. <laughs> He calls. He calls in over Zoom from the car, <laughs> and he's sitting at his desk in Florida. Uh, I, I just read his book, by the way, not to get off track, but he he's put out a book from the Bronx to Wall Street or something. Uh, he he's he's seventy nine or eighty. He's still working seventeen hour days today. Seventeen hour days. He just loves it anyway. And so someone in the audience asks him what he's what he's buying, what he owns, and he takes out off his desk a piece of paper, a print piece of paper, and he reads. 15, it must have been 15 of the 20 stocks that he owns. He just read, well, I, I own this and I own this and I own this and I own this. I've been buying this. I've been buying this. He was just so transparent and awesome. But um, Murray Stahl talked that year. David Marcus. David Marcus runs Michael Price's family office, the late Michael Price. Just, you know, an incredible lineup. But um, so there, Murray Stahl's um, lecture was on investing in royalty companies. Because Murray Stahl believes that um, inflation is going to be higher and more volatile for longer. Not necessarily, you know, six, seven percent inflation, but above the the two percent target, and it's going to be more volatile. And in a high and and volatile inflationary world, he loves royalty companies. Royalty companies own land with natural resources and and lease out the land. To you know, ENPs, exploration and production companies, mining companies. That's how TPL do it. You can get you can just get right on the royalty. You can get a cut of the royalty too. There's different. There are some yeah. different variations. Texas Pacific Land is a big holding of Murray Stahl, and you don't invest any capex or very little, and you don't have any expenses. You're just leasing out land, and so Murray's uh, thesis on these royalty companies like Texas Pacific Land is that the top line is going to grow with inflation. But your expenses don't grow with inflation. So you've got one of these, expenses are flat, top line's growing, and so the margins expand. And so in virtually any environment, these things are generating 40, 50% free cash flow margins across the cycle. If you look at Texas Pacific Land's margins, some of the highest margins you've ever seen. What is this, software? Yeah, exactly. But (laughs) higher, but higher. And so that's what he spoke about then was how to to invest through inflation. but the thing that fascinates me about Murray Stahl is, on the one hand, uh, he's a traditional value investor in the sense that 
Uh, he wants to buy something at a significant discount to his estimate, conservative estimate of intrinsic value. Um, and, you know, he's not scared to look at old economy companies. Um, and, and in the most recent issue of Value Investor Insight, he was saying that, you know, some of these high valued tech names are going to come under pressure for a variety of reasons. One of them being more competition from China, but a variety of reasons. Um, on the other hand, he was one of the earliest investors at scale, at size in Bitcoin. And he's been mining Bitcoin for years now. For Out of years. his basement? No, I'm just kidding. I think it may have start, you know, may have started there, but now he's got a he's got a full operation going. And in this latest issue of Value Investor Insight, he talks about how he plans to hopefully bring his Bitcoin mining company public. Um I'm going to sell the tools and show, I'm going to sell the energy to the Bitcoin miners. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, you have this, this interesting dichotomy where he's, you know, more traditional value focus. And a lot of traditional value investors that I follow are not yet on board with Bitcoin. And I, I don't know if they ever will be, but they're not yet, at least. Murray is, and he was early and he was in size and large. And, you know, he's he's a billionaire. I think he was a billionaire before a lot of the Bitcoin stuff, but he's definitely a billionaire now. What do you think the reticence is for many value investors with Bitcoin? Well, by definition, by definition, if you're an intrinsic value investor, it means you're trying to value the future cash flows of the business. You know, um, you know the value of any of any cash flowing security, any financial security, any financial asset is the present value of future free cash flow. You can't do that with Bitcoin. There, so it's a currency, right? It's like it, a it's much it, more suited to the macro guys who like, you know, they use cup and saucer or bearish army to kind of work out which way Bitcoin's going. But then, you know, I guess the, the intrinsic argument might be different you just methods. short the US dollar printing or you short central central bank currencies. Yeah, that that makes sense. But I, I think I think their reticent, reticence is that uh, it, there's no cash flows to value. It's not throwing off any cash flows, and because of that, they don't believe it can be intrinsically valued. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask this: What's the right price for Bitcoin? <laughs> I wish I knew. Well, uh, that's that's why we. I, I like that little frame that I saw it on I saw it on Twitter. I apologize, where I've stolen this from, but the the frame was. Um, if Michael Saylor buys back, buys all of Bitcoin, what is the intrinsic value of, or what's the value of Bitcoin? What's Bitcoin worth? You know, if Michael Saylor owns a whole lot, it's not worth anything. That's interesting. You know, it'll, it'll be micro strategy that owns it because I've, I, I, don't I think know, he's I think selling he, micro strategy to buy Bitcoin directly. shares a day or something like that of, of micro strategy stock. And so, um, it'll be micro strategy that ends up owning it, but yeah, no, that's interesting. Let me do a quick shout out and then we'll do some veggies. Uh, VA, is that, what's VA? Help me out. Virginia. Virginia. Dubai, Kennesaw, Georgia. Valparaiso. Gothenburg, Sweden. LA in the house. Tallahassee. Antigonish. Seven, Lina, Finland. What's up? Tampa, Miami, Old Ocean, Texas. Hamburg, Ju Germany. Jupiter, Florida. Congrats. Puerto de Mos, Portugal, Mendocino, California, Quebec City, Canada, Boston. What's up? Some good ones in here. Nashville, Tennessee. Congrats. That's a good list. A what do you got list. us for? What do you What do you got for us <laughs> on the veggies, JT? Uh, London, London, UK. Oh, there nice we one. Go. All Sorry, right. Everybody. Uh, so this is um called ants and lions hunting and private equity. So we'll see if we can turn this all into making any sense out of it. But so first a shout out to my man, George, for sending me this uh, delicious little veggies prompt from a, it's from a scientific American little piece that's titled these invasive ants are changing how lions hunt. Uh, so we'll start out with the idea that, you know, regularly, almost every year at the AGMs, Mr. Buffett will say, that in economics, you always have to ask yourself, and then what? And the same is true for another complex adaptive system, which is Mother Nature. 
And we're going to follow a series of and then what's, and we'll see where it goes. And then we'll see if we can draw some lessons back to business and, and investing. So researchers were exploring a, a regional ecosystem in, in Kenya, Africa. And the, there were these ants that were indigenous to that region, and they were fierce defenders of these local acacia trees. So when an elephant would come to graze on the tree, for instance, or trample it over, the ants would swarm the elephant and crawl up inside of its nine foot nose and use their mandibles to pinch, you know, inside the elephant. Not as bad. you can, yeah, it's uh, rather unpleasant, I, I imagine. Uh, and as a result of these ants, the elephants would largely leave these trees alone. Uh, it's not worth it, right? So, and then the, uh, you know, it's it's really not worth going and getting like an ant neti pot uh, every time you <laughs> try to eat a leaf off of a tree. So these these indigenous ants had long protected and their own living home in this symbiotic relationship. Well, recently, researchers found a new invasive species of ant has moved in and they're killing off the local indigenous acacia ants. And these invasive ants are actually smaller than the acacia ants, but they'll they'll team up and they'll hold the acacia ants down by their limbs and then basically like draw and quarter them, uh, you know. They'll di dismember the ant, uh, which is, you know, Mother Nature is not messing around. Um, so in not too long after this, this the new ants are displacing the old ants. And shortly thereafter, herbivores have figured out that these acacia trees aren't being protected by their their little, you know, these tiny protectors. And, and especially the elephants who do a lot of damage rather quickly. So the tree population, of course, has started to decline. And with that less tree cover then... We're going, you know, again, these series of and then what's uh, with less tree cover, the zebras are more safe because the, the trees make it less trees make it harder for a lion to ambush an unsuspecting zebra and make them their lunch. So and then what? What are the lions doing now that they can't eat zebras as readily? Well, it turns out they're, they're they've shifted to hunting buffalo more. Only that's a lot tougher and more dangerous for the lions because the buffalo is twice as massive as the zebra. And they have a much better defense uh, against lions. Like there's videos online of these buffaloes like chucking a 400 pound lion into the air to fend off attacks. Um, and of course, the lions are they're they're at least moderately successful. So the buffalo population is suffering now. Uh, and so this is like kind of a classic butterfly effect, right? You disturb one little small, seemingly inconsequential thing. In this case, a tiny invasive species of ant. And you get this cascading effects where they lead to an eventual decrease in a buffalo population, you know, 10 links down the chain. So the first lesson, I think, is that it's it's fiendishly difficult to predict all of these complex interactions, right? And so it is with economics. No matter how many, how much modeling expertise you have, how much modeling you do, it's impossible to predict, I think, how shifting, uh, like in this, let's say, interest rates, for instance, how they ooze their way into every crevice of the economy and and have and what will manifest because of these changes. So now we're going to shift to talking about private equity and see if we can draw some parallels to our, you know, and then what exercise. So um, Bain and Company came out with a recent report on all things private equity, and this was flagged by a friend of the show, Dan Rasmussen. Um, so in 2023, the deal value fell by 37% from the year before and exit value slid by 44%. So almost half as much. And things are are not very much like they were in the go-go years of like 2021. Uh, and today, nearly half of all global buyout companies have been held for at least four years. So there's like, there's $3.2 trillion of aging, unexited company value on PE's balance sheet right now. And just for context, that was like 1 trillion in 2016. So- and of course, you know, there's a lot of discretion around how you mark these assets. Like good firms are still, they're they're clear about their valuation policies to their LPs and, and are appropriately conservative. But of course, you know, I, I think that uh, Cliff Asnes would agree that, that volatility laundering is still alive and well in the PE industry. Um, and, you know, like if you think about it just from an incentive standpoint, like why, if you were a PE firm, would you want to show bad results? And And also... If you're one of these big pools of capital, like an endowment, why would you want to hear bad results if it's possible that they might smooth themselves away over time, right? Like, of course, like just don't tell me. And if it's if it's going to end up being better later, uh, so I'm kind of left wondering, to whom will private equity exit these 3.2 trillion dollars worth of businesses to themselves, each other, public markets? I mean, those are the the IPO window is a bit a bit frosty lately. Um, and then uh, the FT Alphaville, um, I guess. 
I mean, if you guys follow and read that, but they said that that PE is sitting on an astonishing 2.6 trillion of capital it'll eventually have to deploy. So, um, an, public companies tend to borrow in long term and fixed, and private equity tends to borrow short and floating rate. So often borrowing, and they're often borrowing in private credit markets rather than issuing bonds like a public company would. And so the median sponsor-backed company saw their borrowing rates already move from 4.9% in 2022 to 7.2% in 2023, whereas the the median S&P 500 borrower only moved from 3.2 to 3.7. So the S&Ps hardly even noticed that rates have gone up relative to private equity, which has really seen them gone up, really seen them increase. So for for PE, like basically what was once cheap debt isn't cheap anymore. And then what about like valuations? This is kind of another you know issue that have been talked about. Private equity closed transactions at 13.8 EV to EBITDA in 2021 and 2022. That number used to be more like five times rather Ouch. than 13 times when, when David Swenson was putting up awesome returns at Yale by tipping towards privates. Um, it's so for from reference from 1990 to 2010, private equity returned 14.4 percent per year compared to 8.1 for the S and P 500, and that six per six percent roughly outperformance was net of private equity's two and twenty free structure. So that means the gross return was really more like 20 percent a year for that that kind of heyday. Um, but you know, that's, this there's a feeling that a lot of this compounding is kind of stalling, and last year revenues for PE firms were actually slower growing than the S&P 500, 4% versus 5%. So, and PE backed firms generally have lower margins than public companies. So the rise in interest costs have meant that the median PE backed firm now is actually generating zero free cash flow. Uh, all the margin has basically shrunk and been absorbed by, by debt servicing. Um, so after 40 years of declining rates, in our analogy, like maybe these were sort of the ants that were protecting the acacia trees, Perhaps the Fed elephant has removed the tree cover and these lions are going to have a much more difficult time finding juicy zebras to feast upon. Um, and with so with mo this more expensive debt, perhaps a less target rich and opportunity set, higher valuations, too much money chasing too few assets. It's I personally find it a little hard to be as bullish on the prospects for most of private equity. And of course, I'm sure there are exceptions of people doing smart things. There always are. Um so perhaps they might be forced to hunt more dangerous beasts like buffalo and are more likely than to suffer resulting injuries. And in general, whether it's mother nature or finance, you got to be careful of these small, seemingly inconsequential changes because they can lead to rather consequential consequences that just propagate throughout a system. Good one, JT. That was excellent. Some Thank good you. connections there. The private equity model... Um is one way of converting that flat no growth six PE stock that's doing all the buybacks. It's a way of like turning that into equity appreciation because you're using the you're yeah. using the cash flows to pay down the debt and your equity, you know, assuming that the enterprise value is staying steady, your equity should be going up as the debt comes down. Yeah. How do you how do you become a billionaire in private equity? Borrow a billion dollars <laughs> and pay it back. <laughs> yeah that's true uh I, I, that, that was awesome if my question is if everything is a complex adaptive adaptive system which i think it is markets and economies especially and we can't predict the future because of that what do we do as investors right like that's a conundrum which makes investing hard in the last couple of years investing does doesn't seem that hard Right. If you if you own a tech index, you're doing great. Um, and if you own Spy, you're doing pretty well. Exactly. If you're doing Spy, you're doing very well. Yeah. Um, but it turns out it is hard because it's everything is hard to predict. Yet, as investors, we're trying to make predictions. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see which stocks are going to be higher in the future. And it's a prediction. My mind um, goes. My mind goes to an insurance analogy. And because that is also about predicting the future, it's about, you know, what risks are you taking? Absolutely. Are you being properly compensated to take that risk? And I, you know, I think there's a couple different smart ways to do it. I think that you could think of it like auto insurance, like let's say Geico as a, for instance, and I would like it actually what Toby does to Geico, which is you don't know exactly which of the policies that you write is going to be profitable or not, but you know that as a base 
you know, large law of large numbers expected outcome that you, you have a little bit of an edge there just based on what you're choosing. Um, you're probably, you know, arbitraging some behavioral bias. Um, and, and you, you know, it's not going to, it's going to end up working out okay. And you'll probably do a little bit better than, than average because of that. And then you could, I think occasionally markets throw off just absolute no brainer, um, things that just don't make any sense to the, even a reasonably intelligent business person who's looking at the situation. And, you get paid really well to do that. And, and, and recognizing those, you kind of have to hang around and see them enough to, to find them, but they're very, very rare. And I would liken that then to like specialty insurance, like a G Jane is writing where there's these mispriced things where like, okay, we're getting a ton of premium relative to what we feel like the risk is that we're, we're underwriting. And you just have to be very discerning at that point. And there's, and recognize that it's, it's reasonably rare that those get thrown up, but they do on occasion present themselves. And so I think both of those make sense to me as, as ways to mitigate the uncertainty of, of the future. I mean, that's how I deal with it, especially the way that Tobias does, you know, there's um, overwhelming research and I shared, I think a dozen slides on, on X at one point in time, I can send this to y'all showing that high free cash flow yield is far and away, or owner owning, owner earnings yield, whatever you want to call it, is far and away the best predictor of forward rate of return, far and away. Um, Bank of America looked at 40 metrics. Um, this was about seven or eight years ago, but it looked at 40 metrics and enterprise value to free cash, or free cash flow to enterprise value um, outperformed the market by the most. Manning and Napier, T. Rowe Price, um, several other firms. There, like I said, there's like a dozen slides that I sent all showing that free cash flow yield, high free cash flow yield is far and away the best predictor of market outperformance over a five-year period. Far and away. So it's, it's empirical. I think it it varies a little bit depending on the the type the date that you do sure. it, but free cash flow is it's either it's free cash flow or it's operating income or it's operating cash flow or it's it's one of those more broader based uh, earnings measures than just just the the E right at the very bottom of the their yeah. statement. But I think the interesting thing is how predictive it is. So that's one thing that I've spent a lot of time looking at. How far out can you? So I always thought you know quality. And there's lots of different definitions of quality, but you know we know return on equity is pretty mean reverting, but there are other measures of quality, some of which are less mean reverting. But of all of them, I can't find anything that really has any predictiveness that is anywhere near just the price ratio. So price to free, or free cash flow to EV, say. That is predictive out to about five years. Beyond five years, nothing's predictive. And it's only the price ratios out to about five years. The quality metrics, funnily enough, seem to break down pretty quickly or I can't find the... No, no, that's what the research shows. So the 40 metrics that Bank of America looked at was weren't just valuation. It was quality ratios, profitability ratios, growth ratios, and uh, free cash flow yield far and away was the best predictor of five-year performance. Given that that is the case, what do you think is the utility of building those complex models that go out five to seven years? Marketing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll say I'll say for um, for cyclical industries, I think there's probably some utility in getting a normalized mid-cycle number. I think it doesn't have to be you know five years is you know arbitrary, but uh, I think one of the mistakes some investors make when they're earlier in their career, or you know, retail investors with less experience that just go to Yahoo Finance or some other free site and get a PE is they have no idea what's in that E, right? Like yeah. Yeah. they don't know if that's peak earnings, trough earnings, if there's a asset bunch sale. Of, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I think, I think modeling out a few years can at least help you get to a more mid cycle number, but also normalized number that takes out some of these non-recurring um, one of the challenges of doing so, let's say three years, we agree that you, you have some predictability out to three years. One of the problems with a three-year modeling number is if if it's a high growth company, the growth doesn't really describe the value of the company until it has a few more years to compound. So you're always missing those. You know, I, I don't think that's such a, 
you know, it's a little bit of a bias of my method that it's, it's going to miss those higher growth companies. But I think that the the base rates for those higher growth companies has historically been so bad that it doesn't bother me that they're sort of not being caught in the method. But I'm just like curious, what do you think? Do you, does that does that modeling capture? Does a five or seven year, you know, like smoothing cyclicals make sense? But it is always it also lets you capture some of those higher growth companies. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, if you miss some of the higher growth companies, if you're good at doing what you do, you can generate the exact same returns or better than a high growth investor because you're going to have fewer blow ups. You're going to have fewer blow ups. A high growth investor was going to have more multi baggers potentially, um, but more blow ups. And so in the end, you know, I, I, I've d I've looked into this. I've back tested a lot of performance. I've looked into a lot. I think the best investors outside of Buffett and you know Marks and you know maybe a handful of others on one hand, I think the best investors are doing fifteen percent annualized over time over a career. I think 15%. that's about right. So I think Not that's 20. the right bogey. Yeah, the best of the best are doing fifteen, and some of those are the best of the best growth growth investors, and some of those are the best of the best more value investors. There's a spectrum, of course, of value investing and a spectrum of growth investing. But the rides will be very different. But if you look 15, 10 to 15 years in the future, I think you end up in the exact same place. I think yeah. somebody who can do a sustainable 15 is elite. I think that that's absolutely elite. I, I think it's elite. That's exactly right. Um, I, I know a grizzly old manager who says like anyone who's aiming for more than that is basically almost assuredly going to blow themselves up. Yeah. People don't want to hear that right now because everything's going up every day by a lot, right? And so people don't want to hear that right now. But, you know, Tobias, back to what you said about the free cash flow, it's it's such an important concept. And back to the idea of you can buy in the whole company, you know, if the stock price doesn't go up. A lot of people don't actually think about what free cash flow is. But, you know, Warren Buffett's got this great quote, book value or invested capital is what's been put into the business. Intrinsic value is what you can take out of the business. That's free cash flow. It is, it is what is left to investors after – investing in maintaining and growing the business. It's so that's after, what I was, I was going to yeah. push back a little bit on the, and do a kind of, you know, red team or uh, devil's advocate. How do you avoid then not to name names, but like, let's say like a Boeing situation where they, they borrowed and did a ton of buybacks in a, you know, I don't know, let's say before sure. 2020. Sure. And now operationally have really, not been particularly stellar, it seems. Uh, did they underinvest in their business? How do yeah, you know I, I, where's I the right amount of Intel no. did the Intel did the same exact thing under their prior CEO, where um, you know Intel for a while was the leader in semiconductor manufacturing, but then they just you know they made the decision to invest less in the business, less in R and D. They mortgaged their future. They mortgaged their moat in order to buy back a lot of stock and do this sort of financial engineering. Yeah. There's a time and place when buybacks are absolutely the best use of capital. You know, Buffett has a quote. He says, when your stock is undervalued, <laughs> it's the surest way. The surest way to grow per share value is, is to buy, buy buybacks at a discount, but not if you're sacrificing your moat, right? Not if you're under investing in R and D. And so Intel went through that. Now they have a new leader. Boeing. How do you Boeing identify that in real time? Who did? Yeah. How, yeah. how do you identify how do you tell that in real time? Financial engineering from rather than like after the fact where Intel stumbles, Boeing stumbles. Whoops, we should have paid attention when they were doing that five years ago. How do you know five years ago that they that they hard. would I mean, it's hard. You know, you can probably yeah. you can probably look at uh market share, you know, loss. You know, Intel was definitely there was a point where it started to lose market share and those market share losses started to accelerate and they just came up with a bunch of excuses. It's not easy though. You know, another thing is, you know, ASML, arguably the most important company in the world. Um, Intel had ego, whatever you want to call it saying, we're going to make the most advanced chips in the world without ASML's machines, without their EUV machines. And they said, we're going to try to replicate this. Well, Canon and Nikon tried it over a 20 year period and they, and they gave up. They, they said, uncle, they completely got out of the EUV business completely. It's very hard to do. And if you do do it, you need, you need hundreds of billions over 20 years. And Intel tried it. And then they fell farther behind. So, you know, but that's all hindsight. Like you said, I, I wasn't really doing a deep dive into Intel at the time. Um, but, so, you know, maybe market share losses, something like that. 
Um, it's hard yeah, to know. I think probably that you need to take a, even one more step back from that. And somebody said it in the comments here, but don't buy fast changing uh, industries. Like that's all of these businesses essentially like Microsoft is a business that they've pivoted a few times over the years to get to where they are now. And but that's uncommon. That's unusual for businesses to be able to pivot. Most businesses, especially that large, especially when they just that Kodak, large. you know, they're just like Kodak had the first digital camera. Yeah. And you know, but Buffett whoops. two, three years, two, three weeks ago, I posted, you know, I think eight quotes from Buffett saying virtually that, you know, he, he said, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is just as fascinated by all of these innovations as you are, as the rest of the world is. We're just as fascinated by it. We just don't know how to model. We don't know how to predict it. And, you know, when there's lots of disruptive innovation happening, the ground under those businesses are not stable. And so it's, 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 it's a it's an industry that's very hard to build moats, sustainable moats, and it's an industry that's very hard to build high barriers to entry. Um, yeah, at one point, Bill Gates, I think in the late '90s, said that he because of those exact factors that the tech should probably really trade with a low multiple, lower than most businesses, because it's that terminal value is kind of harder to underwrite with so much disruption. Well, those those ideas come into vogue every. It's every mid mid cycle, yeah. so we've just gone through one where yeah. tech gets a high multiple, but we might go through one where tech gets a low multiple. Obsolescence is a big risk. It's it's a you know it's a it's a big risk. Um, but you know just back to that free cash flow, it, that's what it is. It's it's what the owner could take out. It's what a sole proprietor could take out of the business every year and pay himself a dividend. It's it's after investing and in protecting that moat, after investing in all of the growth down the income statement and the growth down the cash flow statement and working capital and CapEx and acquisitions. After all of that, it's what a proprietor could take out and pay himself or herself a dividend. And so that's why it's so predictive of, you know, if, if a dividend yield is what the company actually pays out as a, as a dividend every year, free cash flow yield is what the company could potentially pay out if it chose to return all of its free cash flow as a dividend. And we've, and, you know, earlier in the show, we went through the math talking about how even if the company is not growing, 0% growth, as long as it's not deteriorating, as long as it's not shrinking, um, company can grow 20% a year if it's buying back, you know, stock at a single digit multiple. And that can go on for a long period of time. That's sustainable growth. It's a shower, not a grower. It's a shower, not a grower. What's what's Buffett's little, you know, is it, was it one of his lieutenants? Ted or Todd has that Sunday lunch with him where they discuss. That Do you Todd, remember the formula? Todd goes to his house. Yeah, the formula is uh, they look at the S and P five hundred, um, and they they have three criteria: uh, what stocks are trading at a forward PE, twelve month forward PE of fifteen or less. Yeah. Which do you have a ninety percent confidence level earnings will be higher five years from now? Doesn't matter yeah. how much higher, just higher. And then which do you have at least a 50% confidence level? Earnings per share can compound by at least 7% over the next five years. What does 7% compound over five years get you to? Is it 50% bigger or something like that? Yeah, it's 50% bigger. What I, what I think it does is if you're buying 15 times or less today, if you're paying 15 times or less today, and a company can grow high single digits, seven, eight, nine, you know, you can grow into a 10 times free cash flow in five years. That's yeah, the right. kicker. Jake, you said it earlier today, grow into a 10% earnings yield. That's sort of like my rough heuristic. I, I lo I'd love to pay 10 times or less today for a growing business. If I can't, I'd really like to see it grow into a 10% free cash flow yield by year five. That's sort of my rough heuristic that I try to stick to. And I'll, get, I'll just go one step further. I know we're running out of time. If it is one of these faster growers that I get seduced by and I pay 20 or 25 times earnings, earnings, uh, I'd like to believe that the earnings per share can grow fast enough so that it drops to a market multiple by year five. So down to 15 or 16 times by year five. Those are rough heuristics for me. Look at a company like Builders First Source with, um, you know, this is a company that um, is, it's put out three-year guidance for three-year forward EPS guidance of $18 of earnings per share. It's at 200 today. So, you know, Builder is trading at 11 times. That's the bot. 18 is the bottom end of its guidance. It's trading at 11 times 
the bottom end of its guidance three years out. Um, and, you know, this company serves absolutely a crucial economic need. It saves its customers time, money, and waste. Uh, and in the last two and a half years, it has bought back 37% of the stock. Hold on, I wrote this down. Uh, so in the last two and a half years, it's bought back 37% of the stock at an average stock price of 83. It's trading at 200 today. I mean, that's pretty impressive. That's Are they still doing buybacks at 200 or do they oh, turn, sorry. Yes. turn it down? Um, so no. So over the next three years, they gave medium-term guidance, three-year guidance. So over the next three years, they plan to buy back another 30 to 40% of the shares at, at 11 times earnings. You know, three year forward, eleven times earnings. Looking at three three year out numbers. Um, Do you ever worry that a company like Builders First Source is beholden to the building? Like we've got this little. I don't know. I just don't know whether this is secular, secular or cyclical. But we we clearly we underbuilt for a long period of time following the GFC. Over ten years, I'd say. Over ten years, yeah, and you can see that in the data that we haven't built enough houses through that period of time, and so now there's this unusual thing in the market where rates have gone up so quickly. People who are have a mortgage pre-2020 or whatever, can't get out of there. Or well, it's probably later than that, pre-2022, pre-2023, are kind of stuck and they can't move. So these new houses that have traditionally been at a huge premium to um, previously owned houses, um, they, they now trade at about the same price. So the builders are just shipping houses and are sort of going through this unusual boom I, I don't know whether it's it's going to peter out this year or whether it's got you know a decade to run i have no idea but do you to what extent do you sort of think about that when you think about something like builders first source so two-thirds of builders first source revenue comes from new home construction um so it's an important part of their business it's the most important part of their business by far um two two things i'd say is um the latest uh What's that podcast, the deep dive uh, business deep dive podcast? I'm not going to be able to think of the name right now, but um, it, they did they did a deep dive on um, D.A. Horton, and the guest who knows the industry very well estimates it's going to take could take 20 years to dig ourselves out of this hole. That's how underbuilt we've been. I've done similar math suggesting it could take us seven to 10 years to build us out of this hole, depending on how many new starts we have a year. So I do think we could have an extended up cycle in new home construction because the supply demand imbalance I feel is, is acute. It's real. We have record low supply inventories home for sale or they're about record lows at the same time when demand is, is sky high because millennials are entering prime home buying years. And so there's an acute, uh, supply demand imbalance, and so I, I think that's I think that's one thing. The other thing with Builders First Source is they've transitioned their business model. A couple of years ago, less than thirty percent of their business came from these value added services. Value added means they're doing things the the construction crew used to do, like so they will completely prefab offsite. Builder will prefab a roof truss or a floor truss or a whole wall panel, and then deliver it and then install it. So that's 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 save labor. Right time, um, they do. They install windows, doors, custom mill work. They build it all offsite and install it. So things that the construction crew used to do, builders is now doing for them. That's much higher margin, eight hundred to one thousand basis points of higher margin than simply distribution of lumber, which is their older business model. Um, there's a lot. They, they've they've been a leader in consolidating the industry, so the industry is much more rational when it comes to pricing. Um, so I, I think there's a lot going for the company and then, you know, just buying back a lot of stock, 37% in less than three years. I certainly like the buybacks. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> I do too. It's weird that we're talking, we're like, we're getting excited about buybacks and, you know, a lot of other investors are getting excited by the NVIDIA conference yesterday, which was very exciting. Don't get me wrong. It's just, you know, there's lots to think. There's there's more than one exciting thing in the market happening right now is all I'm trying to say. What do you make of that? Is that um, sustainable? Is that 
AI. There's a little, there's a little AI kind of, there's a little boomlet going on. It's a little bit like Cisco in the early 2000s, or do you think it's got a sort of longer timeline than that? Actually, we're coming up on time here, John. So <laughs> Speaking of time, right. That's for next time. Have me back. Have me back. Yeah, absolutely. We will. Good good point. Uh, that's John Rotonti. How, how can folks get in contact with you or follow along with what you're doing? I'm on Twitter at jrogrow, so J-R-O-G-R-O-W. And what's your podcast called? The J. Rowe Show. Good name. Thanks. Uh Jake, as always, a pleasure. Great veggies, Jake. I'm getting stronger. Veggies. <laughs> Thanks for Appreciate coming, it. folks. We'll be back uh, next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. I think we've got Eric Cinnamon coming on next week. Oh, fun. Jake managed to lure him out of um, out of, out of his abs- cave. Absolute return bear cave. <laughs> Hibernation. Hibernation yeah. cave, yeah. Uh, Thanks, folks. 